thanks for inviting me to your conference. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I have to confess that I never realised how huge it was. Um, so I'm really pleased to be the, the first person uh, giving a, a paper this morning. And um, it's about open access and it's partly about Finch, but it's not all about Finch. I want to start by saying that I've got a dog called open access. <laughs> and that's how he looked a couple of years ago. I used to take him around the campus with me in Liverpool. In fact, I occasionally used to take him to research committee with me. And he was so quiet and well behaved that people hardly noticed he was there. Uh, but when they did see him, they absolutely loved him. And in fact, Senate passed a resolution saying that everyone ought to have a dog like him. Um, now, nothing much happened as a result of that, because you know what mandates are like in universities. They don't change anything that much. Anyway, a couple of years elapsed and I fed him on Finch's patent dog food for, for a glossier coat and healthier bones. And this is what he looks like now. <laughs> he's still there. He's still there on campus. In fact, he gets quite angry if I don't take him round with me. He's wildly out of control. He's there slavering and spitting and sort of foaming at the mouth. And I keep telling people, don't worry, he's just playful. You know, it, it, it doesn't mean any harm, but it's quite difficult. Um, he seems to have a particular, particular anxiety when he's introduced to arts and humanities academics. And he really hates Russell Group Pro Vice Chancellors for Research. <laughs> So how did it get to this? What, you know, what just happened here, as they say in the rom-coms? Um, well, today I want to do three things, and they're on the, on the screen there. I want to talk about what's happened so far. I want to summarise where we are now, uh, and I want to give you some thoughts about what we do next. Um, I should say that this is very much a perspective on what's happening in, in uh, the UK, but it's important to recognise that open access is like free trade, uh, a borderless cause. In the end, this is not going to work, so to speak, as a little Britain enterprise. So I'm delighted that Fred and Jill are going to be able to broaden out the focus for us a bit. So let's start with the history. It's always good to have a bit of historical background, isn't it? But in this case, it's absolutely essential because your interpretation of where we uh, go next will be very much conditioned by your interpretation of the history so far. If you think that open access in the UK was doing very nicely, thank you, until Finch and RC UK and uh, Hefke started their reckless rampage, then you'll disagree with a lot of what I'm about to say. It's just occurred to me that it actually might be useful uh, if I do a, a slight digression before I start and say something about the funding of research in the United Kingdom, for those of you who aren't uh, funding higher education funding nerds. Um, it's important, this, because obviously a lot of what we do is constrained by funding, isn't it? And it's the people who have the money um, who, who bring about the change. Um, research in, in universities in the UK is predominantly funded by two bodies. Um, one is the research councils, which fund individual uh, uh, research uh, projects in discipline areas, and they have about £5 billion at their disposal. Um, the other body that funds uh, most of the research is the Higher Education Funding Council, which has a budget of about two billion. And that distributes a kind of block grant to universities um, uh, on the basis, really, of the volume and excellence of research in those universities. And I am going to occasionally refer to something called REF, which is likely to take place in 2020 and is going to be the means by which the government determines uh, how much uh, of that research funding from the Higher Education Funding Council uh, each university uh, should get. So there's a, there's a quick digression on funding. Um, I suppose open access began to take off about the turn of the century. I think there was an early period of optimism when we felt that open access was such a luminously good idea that the world would quickly become converted to it. But in the decade that followed the Budapest Declaration in 2002, what we got was gentle progress. Librarians put huge amounts of effort and creativity into the creation of institutional repositories, and we worked hard to, to persuade academics to put articles into them. Uh, but it was hard graft, uh, and according to a study by Laszlo and Bjork in 2010, we'd only got to a stage where about 2.7% of published articles were going into, into institutional repositories, despite the fact that most of the research councils 
mandated open access publishing several years ago, uh, and many universities adopted mandates, which meant that in theory, all the articles generated by their researchers uh, should be available on an open access basis. The Finch view, and this is a quote, was that most universities in the UK and in many other countries have developed repositories, but the rate at which published papers have been deposited in them so far has been disappointing. Uh, I'm always a bit fearful about saying this, because if you tell librarians that their uh, repositories are underpopulated, it's, it's a bit like telling parents that their children are badly behaved and ugly. Um, people don't always take it well, but I, I, you know, I, I, sadly, I think it is, uh, it is the case. Um, now, it's important to note in telling the story of open access in the UK that in general the UK government was very unsupportive of open access in its formative period. Uh, and indeed the Department of Trade and Industry maintained in 2004, um, responding to the House of Commons Select Committee on Scientific Journal Publishing, that there was just no problem with access to journal literature. Everyone had the access they needed through the public library interlibrary loan system. So what happened? What happened next? What got us from this sort of peaceful chugging along with open access to the present tumult and controversy? Well, in popular legend, it's become the Finch Group, hasn't it? But I'm not going to give a Fincher-centric account of the last couple of years, because that's seriously misleading. Finch was just one of a series of things which led to the situation we're in now. It wasn't the Big Bang. And the most important thing about the Finch Report was not so much that it was written as that it was asked for. The real beginning of the turbulent age of open access that we're currently in um, was March 2011, uh, when David Willits conve convened a meeting of the main stakeholders in academic publishing to question us about why the rate of progress in open access publishing had been so slow, and to tell us that the question about open access from his point of view wasn't whether it would happen, but when and how. And the Finch Group was set up to answer the question, how can we make a breakthrough in the volume of open access activity in the United Kingdom? You know, what policy levers can we put in place that might enable us to do that? Uh, and as is well known, um, the recommendation of the Finch Group was that open access was best taken forward through gold open access, uh, with the funders setting aside funding to pay article publication charges. Uh, we also recommended that open access articles published under gold should be made available on a CC BY license, one of the most liberal of the Creative Commons licenses, and the one that basically means that you don't need a team of lawyers to tell you whether you can reuse the article or not. Now, Finch has taken lots of criticism for that decision from people who felt that we should have put the authority of Finch principally behind Green, and I've had lots and lots of conversations with people who feel that that was uh, a serious error, and I respect their views but disagree with them. Uh, there were a number of reasons why we went for gold. Firstly, uh, gold makes it possible to release articles on a liberal reuse license because the publishers generate their profits up front with the APC payment so they don't have to protect the right to make further profit out of the article in the future. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, we had to come up with a dynamic intervention that would really accelerate um, the, the pace of progress towards open access. And to me, funded support for gold open access seemed to be the only option that would more or less guarantee that. If we put our weight behind green, as probably the majority of people say we should have done, what would that have meant in practice? Well, it would have meant a mandate. And if the history of open access has shown anything over the last 10 years, it's that mandates by themselves are relatively ineffective ways of changing publishing behavior among researchers. Finally, it's a form of open access that means an article becomes instantly available. Now, I would grant that the importance of that varies perhaps from discipline to discipline, but it's crucially important in fast-moving scientific areas. Of course, the same immediacy could have been achieved uh, in theory by having green with a zero embargo period. Uh, and, and that's the prescription, I think, that's most often offered to me by colleagues who feel that Finch took a wrong step. But, you know, making that recommendation was beyond uh, 
the politics of practical possibility for the Finch group. Obviously, the publishers on the group would never have agreed to it, so that would have split the group. We wouldn't have had any influence over government policy. It would actually have been a thoroughly uh, silly and self-defeating thing to do. And it's not just that that recommendation to the government wouldn't have worked in the context of Finch, because there were publishers on the group. Whoever recommended it to Biz, uh, uh, they wouldn't accept it because of the damage that they would believe it would do to a sector that is a major export industry uh, and uh, a, a, a very substantial employer. So what happened next? Well, what happened next after Finch were the RCUK and the Hefke policies. Sorry, missed a slide there, didn't I? After Finch made its report, RCUK, uh, the research councils, were first off the blocks. And they released a draft policy which said that the researchers they uh, supported had to publish on an open access basis in journals which complied with their policy. And in order to comply, a journal had either to provide a gold option or a green option with a maximum of six month embargo period or 12 months in the case of humanities and social sciences. They also made enough funding available for about 45% of articles generated from their projects to be made available through Gold Open Access in the first year, which was 2013-14, and then gradually stepping up to about 75%. RCUK uh, got quite a clobbering for this rather bold policy from a number of different directions, uh, and not much covering fire from librarians, really, either, unfortunately. Um, the publishers were upset about the embargo periods, uh, and the, the Russell Group were upset about the general prescriptiveness of the approach and the expense at a time when research budgets are under considerable uh, pressure. Um, it was never going to be the case that the government at a time like this would actually find extra money for this. So yes, they provided funding uh, for gold open access, but they creamed that off from the General Research Council's budget. Uh, and in the face of that, um, the research councils had to make uh, a number of significant uh, uh, concessions. Firstly, they've uh, allowed longer embargo periods for green when the publisher provides a gold option. Um, and Elsevier are interestingly interpreting that as allowing for 48 month embargo periods. Uh, be interesting to discuss that one. Secondly, they're talking about the move towards compliance being a journey. So whereas the initial wording of the policy suggested that 100% of articles published from April 2014 onwards that had been supported by research, uh, funded by the uh, uh, research councils, had to be open access. They're now saying that 45% of articles uh, in 2013-14 have to be published on an open access basis but they're not being prescriptive as to the proportions of gold and green and as regards the other 55% you can more or less do what you like with that so this, that's really a considerably less rapid gallop towards an open access Britain than they originally contemplated the next significant development was the release at the end of uh, February of a document from Hefke giving notice of their intention to enter into a consultation about their open access policy later this year. The, the document, if you read it, actually looks and feels and reads like a draft policy, but they were careful to describe it as setting out their developing intentions, um, the uh, experience of the research councils and the clobbering they got had uh, obviously predisposed Hefke towards a degree of caution. Hefke's proto-policy is more emolliently worded than RLUK's policy, but there's a real bite to its central proposition that in order to be submitted to REF 2020, um, research outputs still to be, uh, uh, subject, subject to some exceptions still to be agreed, have to be made available in open access form. If, Hacks, if Hefke stick to their guns on this one, this is going to be a game changer. It will mean that what researchers consider to be their best outputs will be available on open access. Uh, and since outputs, outputs have to be published in open access form, subject to embargo periods in the case of Green, at the point of publication, UK academics will have to hedge their bets and publish most things on an open access basis because they're not going to be able to take the risk that when it comes to REF in 2020, 
they didn't publish back in you know 2016 in open access form and therefore can't submit what has uh, become acclaimed as one of their best works. Um, the tone of the Hefke document is much more even-handed as between green and gold than the RCUK policy. There's none of the strong and overt encouragement towards gold that you find in Finch and the RCUK policy. On the other hand, since RCUK are no longer being prescriptive about the split between gold and green, it may be that this supposed difference boils down in practice to nothing more than that while RCUK are making funding available for gold open access, Hefke aren't. Um, Hefke, Hefke's attitude to funding for open access is, well, you can do what you want with our money, um, but we're not going to give you a separate, hypothecated uh, stream of funding for open access. Um, on licenses and embargo periods, uh, Hefke seem to want to align themselves with the RCUK approach. So that's where we are. Um, the RCUK policy alone, even in its slightly attenuated form, is likely to deliver a much greater jolt of energy to open access than anything that came before it. And if the eventual Hefke policy is anything like the, the pre-consultation consultation document, there really will be grounds for saying that Britain has become the first open access nation. So it's not surprising that the conventional wisdom at the moment is that the triumph of open access is assured. Which is great, because that means that we don't really have to do anything but watch the, the hidden hand of historic inevitability do its benign work. And what's more, that means I can end this talk, actually, doesn't it? Because that was supposed to be about, last bit was supposed to be about what we do next. Uh, and we don't have to do anything next, because we've reached the end of publishing history, just like so many intellectuals thought that we'd reached the end of world history in the early 1990s. But sorry, no, there's nothing inevitable about the triumph of open access, even though I've heard that phrase about ten times in the last month. The current surge of open access thought and activity in Britain is the product of a delicately poised and contingent set of historical circumstances that may not soon be repeated. We have a Secretary of State for Education who has a genuine belief in the importance of open access. We have key figures in the two major funders of research, David Sweeney uh, at Hefke and Mark Thorley at RCUK, who are very, very strong supporters of open access and who have a genuinely passionate belief in it. That's a very lucky conjunction of circumstances. There is a tide in the affairs of men that taken at the flood leads on to fortune, but the tide will go out as quickly as it came in. There'll be a government reshuffle, perhaps, and our little open access boat could even now be left stranded on the sands. So we have to be resolute, and without any, in any way suspending our critical faculties, we have to give strong support to the actions of those who are trying to create an open access Britain. We have to make sure that our professional bodies give that support and issue statements which, even if they do pick up on the inevitable flaws and defects and downsides of proposals from Hefke and RCUK, sound strongly positive. Because if we don't, the people who believe that open access is an expensive and distracting sideshow, the people who don't believe that making our research available to everyone in the world for free is worth about 1 to 1.5% of the research budget, will win the day. Uh, we need to get into our minds that the choice we have is not between little or no open access on the one hand and perfect open access on the other. The choice in this fallen world is between little or no open access on the one hand and an imperfect and flawed form of open access on the other hand. If we, work, if we wait for the perfect option to emerge, we're going to wait forever. And we ourselves have to provide intelligent advocacy for open access. We have to have ready answers to the questions academics are going to ask us. Um, I was going to say even the daft questions, but actually, particularly the daft ones, like, you know, does Creative Commons prevent me from using quotations? Um, does open access mean that you just pay to publish so there isn't any peer review? Uh, people in universities will be aware that the level of understanding of open access on campus at the moment is extraordinarily low in many cases. We have to work at making gold open access work properly too. By, by making it work, I mean we, we have to work with publishers 
to ensure that there's no double dipping and that we develop a genuinely competitive and transparent APC market where authors have a, a genuine choice between a set of attractive publishing options, attractive in terms of impact and prestige and cachet, but in terms of price as well. We know that we have a hugely dysfunctional market in subscription publishing where there's far too little transparency, so little price pressure on publishers that 35% profit margins are not uncommon, and the big deals mean that there is no real competition at the level of individual journal. And the librarians here know that our failure to bring effective price pressure to bear on publishers is partly because we insulate researchers and academic departments too effectively from the consequences of their journal choices. We have to make sure that we don't reproduce those faults uh, in the APC market. I want to finish by saying that we are really privileged to be the principal actors in this remarkable trans transformation in the dissemination of knowledge. We're on the cusp of being able to make the best that has been thought and said available on a far larger scale than most of us would have thought when we entered the profession. Um, we're on the brink of a breakthrough that will democratise access to scholarship, give the poor the same access to knowledge uh, as the rich, and accelerate the progress of science and medicine so that we make better headway against the challenges that our world is going to face in the coming century. Um, but it's not the time to relax. There's nothing inevitable about any of this. It's time to get to work. Thank you. There are roving mics available. Yep, okay, there's one over on the right. If you just say who you are, in the usual fashion. Hello, my name is Anne Madden from St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. So we're quite a small uh, institution, I suppose, and uh, not like university. But one of the questions I was wondering is on the definition of publicly funded research, um, because an awful lot of evidence is produced by uh, staff working for public bodies and um, effectively that is publicly funded research as well. So is there a thought that that should be included while, you know, while we're going all out to actually look at including that type of research as well? As I think it's certainly an aspiration that all publicly funded research should be covered by this. I mean, obviously the specific initiatives that I've been talking about in the UK um, are uh, particularly applicable to, uh, to universities. Uh, the HEFCI funding streams and the Research Council funding streams. Um, there are, of course, difficulties uh, with gold open access for uh, uh, institutions that are outside that public funded uh, definition, like uh, charities, for example. But, but yes, I think their aspiration is that gold open access becomes universal. And indeed, uh, what one would hope will happen, though we, there can be no certainty about this, um, is that uh, the example that uh, we've come up with in, in Great Britain will uh, spread to the rest of the world. Okay, there's a question at the front. Um, Wilma Mossink, um, Chess Collections. Um, you were talking about developing a transparent APC market. Mm. Um, sometimes I think we're just replacing the negotiations about big deals and licenses with negotiations about AP APCs. How could we prevent that, or do you have any ideas how to create this transparent APC market? It, it's difficult, but, but I don't think it's impossible. Um, I think one of the reasons why the current market is dysfunctional, and it's something I touched on uh, in my talk, um, is that the, the way universities work very effectively insulates researchers and acad academic departments from the consequences of their choices about journal subscriptions. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if I went to an academic four years ago and said, you know, well, we've got a journal crisis, um, you know, I've been paying sort of X percent more each year for my <coughs> journals and that's a disaster and that's very difficult, um, they would think, that, well, a few years ago I had access to 5,000 journals, now I've got access to about 30,000. Uh, bring me more of such crises. You know, this, this, this is great, this is what we want. 
um, it wouldn't really touch them that we were paying, a, you know, that I'd gone, for instance, uh, since the early 1980s from paying a sixteenth of my library budget for journals to paying more than half of the total non-pay and uh, pay budget in journal prices. So one of the things that I think we have to do within universities is achieve a, de a, a degree of devolution uh, of, of financial responsibility to academic departments. It would be very easy, actually, and it would be administratively more convenient to, to administer it all on a centralised basis and just top slice it. But I think if we do that, then we don't give academics any incentive to consider price as part of the range of judgments they make about where to um, uh, publish. And I'm not sort of being crudely price-based here. I realise that academics will take into account impact and prestige and cachet and all those kinds of things, but, but I do think we have to set up circumstances within universities uh, where, where uh, price is considered. I, I, I think although there may be scope for uh, a kind of aggregate approach, we also have to try and avoid the downside of the big deal. I mean, obviously in many ways the big deal was, was great, but um, as we found in recent years, um, it, it, it just removes competition between journals on, on a kind of journal by journal basis because it aggregates things into big blocks. So it's not going to be easy, but I think we have to work hard at it. Not time for more. Otherwise, we'll move on. There's one here. There's one here in the centre. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Graham. Hi, Carrie Calder from Palgrave Macmillan. Um, I was just wondering if you had any insights for the challenges specifically for monographs. Um, obviously, the RCUK policies right now um, affect journal publishing, but with REF 2020, that would have an impact on monographs as well, but they wouldn't be able to um, have such a short embargo period as journals um, if green OA was to be an option. So it brings about its own challenges, but there isn't currently any funding for monograph OA publishing. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think monographs present a particularly tricky challenge, and it's one that Finch, in a sense, ducked. We had such a short period of time to work on our recommendations um, that we decided that other than recommending that more work took place, to develop uh, effective models for monograph publishing on an open access basis, you know, we couldn't really make a, make a judgment on it. And the intractability of that problem was also the reason why uh, Research Councils UK decided that its policy was only going to apply uh, to journals uh, and conference proceedings. Um, the, the, I mean, I haven't got a great expertise in this area, I've got, I, I've got to say. Um, I, 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 my assumption is that it will become a more developed area over the next few years, and obviously the, the assumption of Hefke is that that's the case as well. Um, I think Welcome are likely to require open access monograph publication, uh, sorry, the Welcome Foundation, large um, charitable trust, are likely to uh, require open access monograph publication quite soon, but they're not going to require that um, monographs are published on a CC by basis because they actually recognise that you know monograph authors tend to make some money out of it uh, and may want to continue to do so into the future. So the fact that wel welcome, albeit in probably an easier subject area for this, are going to do it is one of the straws in the wind uh, and it will be interesting to uh, follow the development of that. But RC, uh, uh, Hefke uh, you know, are clearly kind of uh, hedging their bets about uh, uh, monographs and have even floated as one of the possibilities in their draft proto policy uh, 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 that monographs are, are, are exempt from the open access requirement. I mean, when I'm asked about it on campus, as I often am, you know, I, I basically say that th there is unlikely to be a monograph open access publication requirement unless there is a well developed model because you get some people getting very upset about the fact that they might not be able to submit their work to the next uh, ref because, um, because it will be a monograph. Uh, 